Airbnb is changing the way we think about not only hoteling, but the sharing economy in general. We are very fortunate to start off the ULI meeting, hearing from the source how this concept came to be and how it took off, changing the hospitality industry forever and where it'll go in the future. Brian Chesky is the co-founder C and CEO of Airbnb. He drives the company's vision, strategy, and growth as it provides interesting and unique ways for people to travel and changes the lives of its community. Under Brian's leadership, Airbnb stands at the forefront of the sharing economy and has expanded to over 1.5 million listings in 190 countries. Brian is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design and has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Industrial Design. Talking with Brian this morning will be Connie Moore. Connie has the privilege of chatting with him and helping us relate his experiences to the rest of us in the real estate industry. And she has the credentials to do that. Connie served as CEO and President of BRE Properties from 2005 to 2014. Prior to being named CEO, she was responsible for asset management and real estate investment activities and served as Chief Operating Officer and EVP. Connie has also served executive positions at Security Capital Group and affiliates, including co-chairman and chief operating officer at Archstone Communities Trust. She is or has been a director at numerous organizations, including Civio Corporation, the Real Estate Roundtable, Belmont Interpark, Macri Capital Partners, TRI Point Group, and Bridge Housing Corporation. Connie serves as the chairman of the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust and is the chairman of San Jose State University's Tower Foundation. I was very fortunate to hear from another Airbnb uh, colleague earlier this year at a uh, ULI CRE Tech session here in San Francisco, and I recently wrote a blog actually on the sharing economy and commercial real estate. So hopefully what I wrote on the Collier's blog is gonna be accurately reflected today or, or uh, refuted. But in any case, I think we'll have a great session. I very uh, much look forward to hearing from Brian and Connie, so please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Let's start with the company. And for, for the few people in the room that might be, have been under a rock for a while, how do you describe Airbnb? I guess the way I would open it up is to say, people love homes, that's why they live in homes. Our simple idea is, what if you could have a home when you're traveling? And we offer um, 1.7 million homes now in 34,000 cities in 191 countries. And the idea is that it should be as frictionless to get a home as to get a hotel room. So you click a, you click a book it button, you can see the reputation, and so that's really what it is. So what compels someone to be a host? Um, what, I mean, I guess, I guess what compels somebody, I mean, I was the first host with my roommate, Joe, and um, the story starts that, um, just, just a really quick background, I, uh, I went to, so I grew up in Albany, New York. My mom and my dad were both social workers. And growing up, my mom had this piece of advice for me. She said, you know, I picked a job for the love and I didn't make a lot of money, so you should do the opposite. Just get a job and make a lot of money. <laughs> Good advice, mom. And so then I told her, I said, well, I'm gonna be an artist. And she said, you've finally managed to pick the one job that makes less money than a social worker. So I ended up going to Rhode Island School of Design. She said, if you go to RISD, you need to make sure you get a job with health insurance. And so I made a promise to her that I would one day get a job with health insurance. Anyways, I moved to San Francisco, um, and I come here um, in uh, October 2007. So the, what, what happened was, my room, one of my best friends from RISD was Joe. Joe's living in San Francisco. I'm living in LA. I have $1,000 at the bank. I hadn't really saved a lot of money. And Joe comes up and he tells me one weekend, Brian, come to San Francisco. Let's start a company. Now, I had no idea what kind of company we were going to start. I just figured it's some kind of technology company. I get to San Francisco, and Joe tells me, well, actually, the rent is $1,150. So I don't have enough money to, for, to make rent. It turns out that, out, though, that weekend, the International Design Conference was coming to San Francisco. All the hotels are sold out. And we had this idea. What if we just turned our house into a bed and breakfast for a design conference? Unfortunately, I didn't have any beds. Joe happened to have three air beds. So we pulled three air beds out of the closet. We inflated those three air beds, and we realized, ah, it's an air bed and breakfast. And so we created airbedandbreakfast.com. That was how we started it. We ended up having three people stay with us. <laughs> And, and, and I'll get to the, the, the point of the question, which is why do people do it? Well, here's why people do it. We started doing it because we really couldn't afford to stay in our apartments. We started doing it to, to make money. And we like to say that money is the hook. 
but it was a reason more than money that we continue to host and many people continue to host. That one weekend, we had three people stay with us, a 35-year-old woman from Boston, a 45-year-old father of five from Utah, and a 30-year-old from India. There's this weird thing that happens. When somebody comes and they live with you, it, I, I remember somebody described this to me. Let's pretend like you meet somebody. Maybe it's somebody you work with. The amount of time it, you get to, it, it takes for you to get to know them you know, it takes a period of time, then you become friends, and then at some point, maybe they invite you over to your house to have dinner and you get to know them. And that period of time could be like a year. And like the one year arc of a friendship can get compressed in a matter of a couple hours. So when you let somebody into your home, it kind of compresses the relationship, you really get to know them, they come into the most personal spaces that you have, and you often form a very deep connection with the other person. So the number one reason people host isn't actually to make money, we found. It's actually the connection to other people. Even if they're not there, they take this pride of someone else being in their home. And when people most misunderstand Airbnb, I mean, it was really interesting when I saw this video, because you said the Urban Land Institute, like cities are not buildings, they're people. The one thing I would say is Airbnb is not spaces, first and foremost, it's people, it's host. And we're not you know, in the service business, we're in the hospitality business. And the difference is hospital, ser, hospitality is service with heart. It's all about the people. So I think that's the real difference why people host. OK, so you said something interesting. When you think about it, it's, I'm going off, I'm going off script now. Um, you talked about it's all about connections. And one of, one of the things that we think about today is how little we are connecting with people, right? I mean, we're texting, yeah. we're not phoning, we're not talking. Right. So do you think this is our way of sort of saying, OK, but people still need to connect with people, right? Yeah, and I think there's something really amazing by travel. Um, here, here's a interesting, I mean, maybe if you're traveling on business, this isn't the best use case. But if you were to get in a taxi or an Uber in, your t in the city you live in, the odds that you're interested at that moment in talking to your driver, it's probably pretty sim, sim right? You're probably like not paying attention, you're on your phone. And then if I were to tell you to go to Tokyo right now or go to Johannesburg, South Africa or somewhere else, the odds that you'll talk to the person driving you around ask, where are we? What's this neighborhood? What's that? It's very likely you'll actually talk to people. There's something, first of all, beautiful about travel, which is people get in the mindset. They're paying to have fun. They're paying to maybe not be working. So they're in a completely different mindset. And the other thing really great is I think what we represent, which is you know, when we started Airbnb, people thought we were totally crazy. I mean, this was like, yes, I mean. Yes, they did. Yeah, they just, they just said, I, I remember I had a mentor. I told him about the idea of Airbnb. And he said, Brian? And I said, yes. He said, I hope that's not the only idea that you're working on. <laughs> and so that was the advice. Good we, advice. <laughs> and the reason why is people said, strangers will never live with other strangers. It will never work. Like, are you kidding me? And so we believe differently. And the reason we believed it is I thought back to that very first weekend and I realized you can make some really, really deep connections. And I think one of the things that sharing economy represents is it's almost like the third wave of the internet. You know, the first wave of the internet was like stuff online, books online, Amazon, you know, classifieds online, Craigslist. The second wave of the internet is once things come online, online connects to each other. Facebook, Twitter, social media. And the third wave of the internet is the online world moving into the offline world. Uffs, Uber, and other companies like that. And what we really represent is the internet, in many ways, moving into your neighborhood. And that can be a very scary proposition if people don't understand it. But I think when you start to understand it, it actually is a really exciting idea. OK, so as the king of, destru of destruction, so we've got a lot of people here who are very traditional real estate owners, operators. Right. Um, how do you view your relationship with, say, a more traditional hotel? Can you be excess supply for them? How do you think about your relationship with some of the more traditional owners out there, rather well, than just being the destructor? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, you know, you know, we're called disruptors. I never was in love with this term because I was fairly disruptive growing up in class, and that was never a good thing. But um, I think actually we do provide incremental value. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting is, you know, since we've grown and we've added, you know, obviously 1.7 million homes around the world, and so we now have more, you know, so-called inventory than any hotel chain in the world, well, hotels actually have record occupancy. And I think Chip Conley, mm -hmm. you know, we hired Chip Conley, he's the CEO, and he was the former CEO and um, founder of Joie de Vie Hotel Group, a very important boutique hotel group, and he's speaking, I believe, like later today mm -hmm. or maybe tomorrow. 
But one of the things he's uh, you know, taught, and taught me, and he's been very much a, a voice, is that I think for us to win, nobody in hospitality necessarily has to lose. I think it's very easy to think of this market as a zero-sum game until you realize the travel industry is a more than $2 trillion market. It's starting to rival industries like the oil industry. And very, very few markets could even really, um, can really you know, accept all the different people. So take one example. Hotels have record occupancy. Take Brazil. Last year, the World Cup went to Brazil. You had 600,000 people last year go to Brazil for the World Cup. This was a huge event, one of the largest global events ever. One in five people that went to the, the World Cup in Brazil, 120,000 stayed in Airbnb. So we had 120,000 people stay in Airbnb in Brazil. They did not have enough hotels to build because they couldn't have justified building those hotels for post-World um, Cup. And so I think that we really allow cities to swell for large events. 40% um, of travel, supposedly, in the United States is staying with friends and family. So if we're disrupting anything, we might disrupt you staying with your parents. And I don't know if that's a horrible thing to do. Um, and we've also found a few other things. I mean, I think the use cases are quite different. I don't want to say nobody that would have stayed in a hotel stays in Airbnb, but people in Airbnb tend to stay twice as long. 80% of them stay outside the hotel district. So if you stay in a hotel, you typically stay here. If you stay in Airbnb, you're probably staying like in the Mission, or you're staying in Hayes Valley. So it's a fairly different use case, and I believe that one industry kind of lifts lift up the other. I think we're all in the industry of travel. In many ways, we're competing with people not leaving their homes. And I think the evidence of why we're not necessarily competing is just what most hotel CEOs say, and most of them have fairly good things to say about us. It's surprising to mm -hmm. a lot of people. Well, I think that was your experience in Philadelphia, right? Yeah. When the Pope came, all of a sudden yeah. it swelled, right? Because right. it couldn't accommodate totally. all of the, yeah. Yeah, the main thing, the main, the only real impact I've seen that we've had on the hotel is um, when large events come to town, you know, it could like, it could reduce the amount they can charge, um, like the kind of so-called surge pricing. And you saw this in um, Omaha, uh, Omaha, for example. Um, Warren Buffett had the Berkshire Hathaway conference. Mm -hmm. um, the hotels were filled up. They started rising, pr raising prices. People couldn't afford to stay in the hotel room, so Warren reached out to the team, or his team reached out to our team. We became an official like, kind of provider of accommodations, and I think it kind of kept things within reason. But I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Mm -mm. Do you see corporations now sort of insisting or suggesting strongly that their associates actually stay at Airbnb when they're traveling on business? Has that become sort of a new dynamic? It's, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, when we, you know, obviously when we first started, um, just like the idea was considered crazy, the notion that a company would travel on Airbnb was fairly crazy. And um, the whole pro uh, proposition's gotten a bit more professional in the sense that there is a, there are a class of homes that are much more consistent. You know what you're going to get. And we've now signed up, I think, you know, Chip leads this team, we've signed up over 5,000 businesses that now travel on Airbnb. And I think the two things they found are this. Number one, typically you'll save a fair amount of money if you're traveling on Airbnb. So companies obviously have an interest in it, and sometimes employees get to keep the per diem difference or something. So it's clearly in people's interest. But the other thing we found about business travelers is business travelers are some of, frank, very frequent business travelers are some of the loneliest people because you're constantly away from home. And the more you're away from home, the more you sometimes seek home. And Airbnb is the closest thing to home, I think, away from your home. All right, so let's, let's shift to multifamily. So yeah. as an old multifamily person, so are, are multifamily operators feeling threatened by what you're doing? Are they sort of saying, look, we can't fight them, let's join them, we've, we've got excess capacity, how can we work with Airbnb to sort of say, because most of us are, you know, 93 to 95% occupied all the time. Well, that means there's 5% availability in any city, any time. So can you be that swell occupancy for multifamily, and how are, how are you dealing with multifamily operators? It's, it's certainly changed, I think. For a lot of large developers, um, Airbnb was something initially that was not well understood. And it was not, you know, it was, I think it was this generational thing. That's a tech thing. It's for young people. It's not something for us. It's not something we can leverage or use. And it was considered maybe not a tool for them. I think what's happened is many um, developers and many, you know, many, many families have realized this is something that can apply to us. A number of really fascinating stats. This was a site that was started for people in their mid-20s, and yet the average host in Airbnb is 39 years old. 
Um, we have more hosts over the age of 60 than under the age of 25, including baby boomers and people like my parents, and you, know, you have empty nesters. Um, it makes complete sense. So I think that ultimately we wanted to make this product incredibly easy, incredibly accessible, and incredibly open for many people. And the very simple notion is if you have extra space, somebody wants, you're not using it, somebody has demand for that space. It's actually incredibly simple, and then the market dynamics kind of provide a very perfect pricing mechanism. So if the average host is 39, what's the average guest? 34 years old. 34. And there's more women than men that are on both sides of the equation. Which is also, That's I think, to some surprising. people, yeah, the people yeah. are surprised by that. All right, let's shift a little bit um, to leadership and culture. Um, so um, I was on your webpage, and one of your recent interns said they described Airbnb as the type of place where you get calluses from clapping, strong fingers from coding, abs from laughing, and delicious food. So I just want you to know that I can do three of those four. I'll let you figure out which the fourth one I can't do. So how would you describe Airbnb's culture? Um, I think that when people describe Airbnb's culture, and you know, we really welcome people visiting our office. It's um, at 8th and Brandon Street. Um, we've really tried to make an impression on people when they get off the elevator. And the one thing, a, a few things people describe when they meet people at Airbnb is how welcoming they are, friendly they are, and optimistic they are. There's this like, kind of wave of positive energy that you just see a lot of people really smiling. And we, we don't coach people to like, smile or be happy. I mean, you certainly can't do that in your office. People will do that for five minutes, and then they'll be back to however they're really feeling. Um, so we've had this core belief. And the belief was really passionate people that are really happy to work for you put that passion into the products. And that, that passion creates extremely passionate, happy customers. And so in other words, it's the notion of inside out. Whatever happens inside the building eventually manifests outside the building. So if you want to see change outside the world, the best place to start is inside the building with your own world and your own team. And so I think that really, really great culture starts with the strong sense of purpose and core values. You know, I was never a big, you know, I never really wanted to create a company that became hugely bureaucratic with tons of rules, um, a company that, like, you know, really entrepreneurial people feel, would feel stifled in. And what I've noticed is that companies have to be governed by rules, and they have to be governed by one or two rules, either cultural rules and norms or heavy, heavy processes. And you need a bit of both. But this, we find the stronger the culture, the more you can trust people to do the right thing. And if you can't actually trust them to do the right thing, like if you can just say do the right thing and you actually can't trust that they know what that means, then you need to say what the right thing is and you have to like in detail do everything, in which case you can't really empower them. So we try to make sure that um, everyone fits our core values and one of our core values, our first core value is to be a host, quite literally, meaning you have to provide an experience of belonging. And our mission is not about space, um, it's about something much deeper. And the way I would describe what we really do, it really comes back to the story. In early 2012, I met a host in London. I was in London, and I met a host. His name is Sebastian. He comes up to me, and he says, Brian, there's this word you never use in your website. And I said, well, what's that word? He said, that word is friendship. I said, I'd love to tell you a story about friendship. I said, okay, tell me that story. He said, six months ago, the London riots broke out outside my home, and I was very scared. And the next day, my mom called me to make sure I was okay. He said, here's the interesting thing. Between the time the riots broke out and the time my mom called me, it was a 24-hour period of time. And he said, in that period of time, seven of my previous Airbnb guests called me just to make sure I was okay. And he said, you can imagine how many of them would have called the hotel to make sure the hotel was okay. And the point is that the reason they called Sebastian wasn't because he provided a space. It's because he provided belonging. And our mission, the reason we exist, is to create a world where you feel like you can belong in any city, any village, or any country. And most of us feel like we belong in our jobs. Most of us feel like we belong in our homes. But then we travel somewhere, and it's very possible that we feel like a stranger. We feel like an outsider. And what's the point of traveling somewhere just to feel like you're totally an outsider? 
We want you to feel like you live somewhere, that you're actually welcomed into that community. And that is only possible when a world of people are really host to you and welcome you. So the number one thing that I would say that identifies our core values is when you walk in the building, people are host. And we really make sure when we hire people that every single person's a host, that they're not just trying to have a job, they're finding something more meaningful. But that gets more difficult for, for you know, I started it when I was at Security Capital, small group. Right. And the group that started was very much about building a business. But by the time you went from the first three to the 850 person, right? That 850th person was like, okay, tell me um, about your 401k, tell me about your benefits, tell me about all the structure that you're yeah. used to. And so the, the fourth person and the 850th person was a very different person right. in terms of building a business. So how do you keep that going? Right. Because your business is growing right I can talk about some of the things you do. I mean, ultimately, a really strong culture look, can look a little bit like a movement, meaning that people that join late may be as passionate or more passionate than people that join early. And I would say that people that join today are in many ways as passionate or when they start maybe more passionate because there's more history, there's more to kind of join and be a part of. Some of the th I'll just mention some of the things I did. Um, I was, and, and this is to the dismay of my team, I interviewed probably the first three or 400 people myself. So, and I basically waited until our recruiting team begged me to stop interviewing people because to get them on my calendar was slowing down the recruiting process. And then one year after that, I stopped actually doing it. So I was fairly neurotic about this. And then, you know, but I was, in, in my interviews, I didn't, I wasn't interviewing for intelligence or skill set. I figured, you know, you've, that, that's, you've been interviewed for that. I want to know why you're here. What do you actually care about? It's the why. And once I can no longer do that, we have 2,000 people now. So once I can no longer do that, we created basically what we called like a core values council. And I picked like 10 to 15 people throughout the company that I said, if we could hire another 100 people that were as passionate as this person, we would be doing really, really well. And I brought them in the room, and I said, I am now handing the keys of Airbnb to you, and that you really hold the culture. And so now all people who join Airbnb, and that team from 15 has now grown to like 75 or more, they are people that are selected by their peers. They're not just functional leaders, they're values leaders. And every single person that gets interviewed at Airbnb has to get interviewed by two core values interviewers, and any one of them can have a veto on the people that get interviewed. So if an executive wants to bring over a member of their team from a different company or something, they still have to get through the core values interviews. That's just one of the examples. The other is you just have to constantly remind people of what's important. I noticed, for example, during employee orientation, there's this you know, propensity to want to talk about, okay, great, here's your computer, here's how the, here's how the benefits work, here's your like, dental plan, here's this, here's that, here's your badge, here's where food is, and I thought, what you first tell people tells them what's important. And if that's all the stuff you're telling them, you're telling them their self-interest and their self-needs are the most important thing at the company. And so we decided we have to do some of that stuff, but that before they join Airbnb, a couple things. Number one, I want to make sure before you joined that you actually knew the whole purpose of the company. So if I actually interview people, I actually make sure they've done their homework. Orientation is not meant to learn about the purpose of the company. And then I made sure when we, you start Airbnb, it's all about understanding why you're here, not like what the food program is, although there is some orientation there. So, and you know, if, and, and I wrote an essay to the company, I ended up posting online, and the title of the email that I sent to them was don't f up the culture. And I basically said That's like- That's pretty clear. Yeah, it was pretty clear. And I said do not f up the culture. We're giving this culture to you. This is your company. You're all owners of this company. Don't f it up. So how did the HR person deal with that? Uh, my HR person would say, Connie, we don't talk that way at Beery. Well, my HR person hates the word HR, so that okay. was really good. Okay, all right, well, that was good. <laughs> so, so that says something about that person. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about vision. So from 2007, 2008, from those three um, air mattresses, how has your vision changed? It's totally changed. I mean, my vision in October 2007 was pay hey. rent, don't get evicted. So that was like the extent of our vision. I mean, th just, just so you know, like there's a whole history beyond the founding story, which is actually kind of crazy. Um, so we launched this website in October 2007. 
pay rent one weekend. This is not meant to be the big idea. I mean, if, if I was trying to make a lot of money, I wouldn't have, or be really successful, I wouldn't have like turned my home into an air bed and breakfast. That wasn't, that wouldn't, I would have never connected dots to today. Um, I went home for Christmas um, in late 2007, and then I came back 2008 with Joe, and we had this idea. These three people love sleeping in air beds in our living room. What if we could build a website, air beds for conferences around the United States? That was the second version of the website. We launched that website, and we had two customers, and I was one of the two customers. So the second version of Airbnb did not work very didn't work, well. Didn't work so then the third version of Airbnb, we actually launched something similar to today, which is um, we basically we realized people don't just want to sleep on air beds. In fact, one person said, I want to rent my bedroom. Do I have to buy an airbed and put it on top of my mattress? Because it was called Airbed <laughs> and Breakfast. And I thought, that seems kind of crazy. Let's get rid of the airbed part. And then a lot of people said, like, I want to use you know, Airbed and Breakfast, but I don't have a conference to go to. And so we thought, why is it limited to conferences? So then the vision in 2008 was bedrooms, be able to book a bedroom. We never even, it never even occurred to us you could rent your whole home. It wasn't really about that. So it was really about booking bedrooms around the world, and we launched a Democratic National Convention. Barack Obama was obviously running for president. He was supposed to speak in the Pepsi Arena, I think, in Denver, which had 20,000 people. They move him to where the Broncos play. It's like an 80,000-seat football stadium. And so suddenly you have thousands of people that need housing in Denver. So we decided there were all these, like, you know, and like Fox News, everyone's like doing, where will they see DNC housing crisis with sirens and alerts and all this stuff. So it kind of was like the hysteria was perfect for us. And we're like, they'll stay in Airbnb. And within a few weeks, we went from a few guys with no business, new, no money, to a few guys, we still had no business or money, but we were on like CNN and New York Times. And then we launched. I thought we were gonna be huge, could we provide housing this one weekend? The following weekend, after the Democratic National Convention, we had like three people use this again. And I realized, if only there were political conventions every week, we'd have a great business. <laughs> so we didn't know what to do, and um, we basically couldn't afford to like keep the site going. I had no money. You know, those, uh, we tried to raise money from investors. We were trying to raise $150,000, um, and we were gonna sell 10% of the company to do that. And no investors wanted that deal. It would have been a very, obviously, good deal today. It, obviously, it would have, yes. And nobody wanted that. And so then what we decided to do, the first thing we did, you know those binders you put baseball cards in? We actually put credit cards in them. We actually started funding the company to credit cards. And then in late 2008, this is how we actually funded the company. We started selling collectible breakfast cereal. Because we're airbed and breakfast, we realized, well, airbeds aren't making a lot of money. Maybe breakfast cereal will. And so we started selling Barack Obama-themed breakfast cereal. We called it Obama O's, the <laughs> breakfast of change. We started selling John McCain-themed cereal, <laughs> Captain McCain's, like Captain Crunch, a maverick in every bite. We made $30,000, and that's what really funded the company. In early 2000... Do, do, do either um, President Obama or John McCain know that? I think uh, President Obama did receive a box, a box of Obama of, O's. Okay. Um, anyway, the point of the story <laughs> is that the point of the story is that the vision eventually became, you know, in 2009 we started billing ourselves the eBay of space. One of our investors said, you know, you should tell investors of the eBay of space because eBay was huge and everyone has space. And I thought that's really smart. But eventually, it became very clear that Airbnb is about much more than space, it's about people. And so, you know, in around 2009, we really changed our vision. But I guess the point of the story is, the vision kind of constantly evolved and it grew more ambitious over time. Yes, it did. Yes. Okay. Um, if you could change one thing, what would you change? About anything? Uh, well, let's keep it to Airbnb. <laughs> okay. I mean, either your vision, your what's, what's working, what's not, what would you change? Um, you know, there's something kind of weird about, um, you know, I, 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 oh, I never love being part of the status quo or the establishment. That becomes clear. Yeah. But eventually, you know, we have, we're going to pretty soon have two million homes, and pretty soon we will become part of the establishment and we will become, a, in, a, in a sense, the status quo. And the company itself will become the status quo. And so there's this weird conflict I have where that's not really in my nature. Because my nature is I always, you know, I went to RISD, and I had a teacher that told me, Brian, you're a designer. Everything around you could be desi it was designed by other people. You can redesign the world you live in. So I'm constantly obsessed with redesigning things and reinventing things. 
So now I have a, we have this company, we've designed, and so if I could change one thing, it's really kind of, I mean, this is kind of weird, but like what I'm really interested in is Airbnb 2.0. And, and it's really continued to transform the company. You know, we're in the technology industry, and one definition of technology is change. So our core competency has to be, we have to be willing to change and not be viewed as static. And I think eventually, in many ways, we're all in the technology industry because we all use technology. And so what I'm really interested in, and what I'm actually working on changing, is continue to shift Airbnb from spaces to experiences. So in other words, you don't go to a city to stay in a home. You go to a city to have experiences. So today, you go to Airbnb, and you can go to Paris, and you can stay in 60,000 homes. But that's the limit of Airbnb in Paris today. And I hope tomorrow, when you go to Paris, not only can you get a home, but you can, you know, you can pro get experiences provided th throughout the entire city on Airbnb. And so I think that's w what I'm most interested in doing, is redefining what it means to be a, a host. And a host in the future isn't just somebody who offers a home. A ho host is somebody who offers a service or hospitality in a city. And once you change your mindset about that, there's 30, 40, 50 types of ways people can host in a city, not just with their home. And that's probably the thing I'm most excited about changing. So how do you, with all of these hosts, how do you maintain control? How do you maintain control? How do you maintain quality so that, because you are, you're, you're right, it's not just a space, it's the experience that right. you're providing for your guests, right? So how do you ensure that all of these hosts around the globe are sort of supporting your vision and your brand? So that's a really good question. Um, when we first launched, I, I kind of came from the kind of Craigslist, Craig Newmark, Pierre Midiar school of thought. And the way they approached their websites, Craigslist and eBay, were essentially um, communities are like immune systems. And so you shouldn't try to control the community. You should build a reputation system, reviews, moderation tools. And like an immune system, the community will self-regulate and self-moderate. To an extent, that works, but only to an extent. And that might be really good for like delivering packages, things like that. But when you're traveling, it's your one, once a year vacation, and you're actually sleeping in someone else's home, and a woman in Texas staying with a guy in the Middle East, and there's all sorts of interesting cultural norms that get broken down, you can't just be believe that the community is a moderation and immune system. You actually have to have some hospitality standards. A few years ago, I never considered ourselves a hospitality company. I figured hospitality is what hotels offer. And I was reading about the definition of hospitality. It really, like, a lot, like the Cornell University textbook, talks about hospitality as if you welcome people in your homes. And a light bulb went off. And I thought, you know, the hotel industry knows a thing or two about hospitality and standards and consistency around the world. And that's when we recruited and uh, uh, brought Chip Conley in. Chip Conley joined as, and he was the founder of Joie de Vie Hotel Group, he joined as the head of hospitality Airbnb, and he basically set about trying to create a level of certainty and reassurance and consistency to something that is inherently, frankly, inconsistent. Meaning we, we actually don't control the product, we don't control, because our product are people, and we can't control what 1.7 million people on the, or, you know, homes and people around the world do. But Chip basically said, there's a series of nine hospitality standards. Everyone needs to meet these standards. We need to educate these people on what these standards are. And then we need to basically hold them accountable. And so that's what Chip's done. And that's a, quite a difficult thing to do, but I think he's been fairly successful. And the whole thing does work on the review system. About 70% of people who book Airbnbs leave a review. So we've accumulated tens of millions of reviews. We have recognition programs, so like I think about 5% of our hosts are super hosts. They get a badge. It represents the very best of Airbnb. And then we, at the bottom end, remove thousands of hosts literally every single day because they're not providing the level of hospitality that we expect. And that's coming from feedback from the that's guests. That's coming from feedback from the community. We have a backstop. We have a 250-person trust and safety team, and they also do quite a bit of work on the back end to make sure that you know, people are providing great and safe experiences. Okay. So um, there's a lot of traditional real estate people here. There's a lot of people, who, most of these people work in offices. Some of them build offices. Um, some of them design offices. How do you, you know, here in, in the Bay Area particularly, 
we hear about all these amazing office spaces and it's all tied to sort of their corporate culture. How do you think about your office space and how you're growing and how does that tie in with your corporate culture, your hospitable culture? How do you think about that and how does that drive your vision? Um, I think that from probably the very beginning, we felt like, we, 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 we thought about a few things. Number one, there's, a, for a lot of companies, I noticed a couple of things were kind of strange. People have immense pride in the design of their homes. And they care deeply about every object in their homes, the design of their homes. And frankly, a lot of people don't actually spend a ton of time in their homes, and very few people ever see their homes. Maybe they have like a dinner party a couple times a year. People spend a lot more time in the office. And there's something weird that a lot of offices aren't maybe as inspired in their design as homes. And we thought, very simply, number one, you're gonna spend as much time or more time in the office than you are at home. Why is this a less comfortable place? In fact, this should be a more comfortable place than your home. The other thing we thought is, we think space could be a strategic advantage to us. In other words, even in Silicon Valley, where everyone's really trying to have nice spaces, we think that we can design a space that embodies our values and people walk in and they say, I want to be a part of this company. And the third thing is I think a space has to completely kind of be consistent with your values. There's nothing worse than like having an image of what a company looks like and you walk in to the office and if you could be any company, you can't tell who the company is when you walk in. You could have just replaced the logos everywhere and it wouldn't have made a difference because it's a generic place. And we thought, this place should completely embody our values. So we did some kind of quirky things. All meeting rooms on Airbnb. I mean, we basically said, you know, a lot of people and companies hate meetings, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. But one of the reasons why is sometimes they're in these like drop ceilings of fluorescent lights on you, and it's very sterile, and it's like not really that fun, but you go to a restaurant and you have a conversation with somebody and it's like a lot more fun. And so we thought, what if meeting rooms are more exciting? So we designed our meeting rooms after apartments on Airbnb. So you actually walk into you know, like a recreation of a home and you have a meeting there. So we've tried to do a lot you of have things an air in space. Mattress there? Um, we actually did recreate my original apartment <laughs> as one of the meeting rooms. So that's, those are some of the things we do with space. Mm -hmm. All right, let's shift it a little bit. Um, so obviously success kind of invites some challenges and um, while we're here in San Francisco, I don't wanna make this a San Francisco discussion because obviously you have challenges around um, many cities. So how are you dealing with sort of the pace and change of all the regulations that are sort of being peppered at you? As pe because again, you're, you're disrupting sort of the status quo. Um, from a, from cities' perspective, and you know, and obviously cities are looking for any way to, to raise money, and it's like, okay, here's something new. So, how are you dealing with this change of all this regulation across across the globe? So, um, you know, we're in 34,000 cities, and the really difficult thing is that um, Airbnb is predominantly regulated at the city level. So that means, and the other thing is that there is not a standardization of regulation. There's not some like universal commerce code. So that basically means you have a variation of like 34,000 different cities with basically different regulations around the world. So that means you gotta go basically city by city. So very simply, um, we, we made a couple decisions. The first is we decided it was very important and part of our values that we're partners to cities. In other words, we cannot be a brand that fights our way into cities or fights cities. Because we have to create a world where like people are willing to live together. And if we're a brand that's fighting and then people are living together, that's kind of a bad mix. So we realized we really have to be good partners and we have to enrich the cities we serve. So our approach was, let's start with our very, very big cities. We can't talk to all 34,000 cities at once. We're gonna start with our top like 100 cities and let's try to be proactive in our outreach to cities. And we've realized most of the problems we've had in cities, we have had some problems in cities, come from a lack of understanding. In other words, I don't have a lot of uh, examples of where the more a city learned about us, the worse things got. It's almost entirely the other way around. The more cities learn about Airbnb, the more comfortable they get. And the more we learn about Air, like the cities, the more we can adopt our needs. And some of the things we've done is, you know, hotel tax. We are collecting and remitting hotel tax in over a dozen cities. We just announced Paris. We do it here in San Francisco, Portland, Chicago, and there's many more cities coming. Um, we have a lot of partnerships to cities. We have like a disaster relief partnership. So when Hurricane Sandy happened in 2012, 
you know, there were a lot of residents that had nowhere to stay, so we now partner with cities, which means in minutes, you can provide housing for free to refugee, to people that are evacuees. So we've really tried to create a, a partnership. And together, we've also created some model legislation that really recognizes home sharing in cities. And the very basic principle is that, you know, there are people and there are large companies. So you have a private person living in a home, you have large hotels, and that really Airbnb in many ways, it's hard to fit them in one box to the other, and that you have to create a third category. And so we've worked with cities to say, let's adopt a category just for Airbnb. Let's start from the ground up. How do you want to regulate this? And we found, I think, quite a bit of success. So you're starting with the bigger cities, but do you think this will then be a model in your 34,000 cities? Do you sort of say, okay, yes. if it works in San Francisco and New York, then it can work in right. Pocatello, Idaho? Yeah, and we, and we passed uh, like we, we passed regulation. Um, San Francisco is a fairly complicated case because we passed a, a, a law here, and then there are some opponents that introduced a, a, a ballot initiative to kind of essentially unwind that law, but not with San Francisco, which is kind of its own case. Um, you know, San Jose, for example, which is a bigger city in San Francisco, we passed a model uh, law, and then, then city by city, a lot of cities around the Bay Area, you know, you have Berkeley and other cities in the, in the, in the area in Palo Alto, are starting to look to them for guidance, and we're starting to see, like, a wave of cities throughout um, this, the state of California copying them. Um, there are some countries where there were federal laws passed. So the country of France passed a national housing law that recognized Airbnb, and this was in the beginning of 2014. So it essentially created like, a recognition of the category. Um, the Queen of England signed into law um, last, this, the beginning of this year, recognizing Airbnb in London. So we've had some kind of laws signed at the federal level, but in the United States, it's primarily at the city level, and it's typically up to the mayor and the city council. Do you see it being done at the federal level here? Um, it would certainly make things easier. Um, I, but I don't think so. I think that um, I, I, I think it's very difficult to imagine um, a, a federal system kind of imposing kind of housing laws and governing how people live in their space, um, superseding like states and cities. I don't, I don't know if I see that. Yeah, I would, we, have, we, we sort of have a pretty strong I think states' rights in this country. So yeah, I so I, I think in, other, in Europe you see that yeah. more often. There are national laws in Europe. Do you have any challenges um, with unions? Because um, clearly, you know, a lot of the cities, obviously San Francisco is a city that um, very strong unions and, and, you know, and hotels tend to have very strong union employees. So how have you, have you had any issues with unions? As yeah, I mean, we've had opposition from u hotel unions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, I don't think it would be a huge surprise. It's not really a secret right. that um, there are hotel unions in the United States that have some pretty big issues at Airbnb. This is primarily constrained the United States. I should just put these things in the context by saying about one third of our business is the United States. About half our business is in Europe, mm -hmm. and the rest of the business is around the world. So, to, so it is concentrated to about a third of our business, and even there it's only in a few cities, like New York, for example, where there was some opposition from some hotel unions. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're trying to find a way to work with everyone. Great. Um, let's just go through just a couple of letters. Um, you, so you recently went to Kenya um, as a presidential ambassador for the global entrepreneurship to talk with entrepreneurs around the world. What did you learn from them, and what did they learn from you? Yeah, so I, um, I, I, you know, as we've gotten more successful, I've started speaking more about entrepreneurship and starting a company, and in many ways, I'm a perfect kind of story because I was seven years ago an unemployed artist and designer, and so then this improbable story, you know, it, it seems pretty crazy. Um, the thing I was surprised about, so I went to Nairobi, Kenya, it was this global entrepreneur summit, and they convened like entrepreneurships for, entrepreneurs from all over the world, really, and there were people, a lot of them were my age, um, they had all these different ideas. And I don't know, I guess the thing that so surprised me was how universal they are. Like in other words, everyone's very similar. The thing that shocked me as I've traveled the world isn't how different people are, it's how similar they are. Mm -hmm. So like 10% of all of us is like extremely different and those are specific to culture. But I kind of have, to be honest, the same conversations in all over the world, in every, con in every country. And I basically just talked about how um, in Africa, you know, there hasn't been a lot of m large internet companies, but internet penetration in Africa is growing very, very quickly, and there's no reason for 
not a great African company to emerge from Africa, but a great global company. Almost all global internet companies today are founded in the United States. And in fact, almost all global internet companies today are founded in San Francisco or the Bay Area. There's no reason why global internet companies couldn't be launched out of Africa or other continents. It doesn't, there's no like reason it has to happen right. here. It's and it, the number one limiting factor are entrepreneurs. A great idea can come from anywhere. Right. So um, you guys you recently brought on um, Lawrence Tassi as your CFO, and in your quote, you said he's going to take Airbnb to the next level. So what's the next level? Well, the funny thing about um, Lawrence Tosi, we call him LT, um, is uh, you know he was CFO of Blackstone. I know, so kind of. And a so big he company. he oversaw and led the purchase of Hilton Hotels. Mm -hmm. So um, that was certainly appealing. In other words, um, Hilton is the largest hotel group in the world um, by number of spaces. He deeply understood hospitality. And I, we were really interested in getting one of the very best CFOs in the world. And LT was just unbelievable. And my view on CFOs is you've got kind of like three, three kind of tiers. So it's almost like a pyramid, a Maslow's pyramid of CFOs. And the base of it is they're great at like the financial chops and accounting. The kind of middle is they can help you plan and they can really help you be a bit more strategic in finance. And the top of the pyramid is they're actually a great business partner. They actually help you think through the strategy of the future of the company. And we were looking for somebody that could do all three of those because I don't have a COO. And LT was a great business partner to me. And for me, the next level is thinking through how to be very strategic in investing really aggressively all over the world. And just one example of that is, you know, we're a global company. And um, this past summer, we had a million people in a single night stay in an Airbnb, just in one night. So this, the population large in the city of San Francisco was sleeping at home in one night. And we talked about where are the big opportunities to grow. And one of the huge opportunities is China. And it's, very, it's been really difficult for American internet companies to succeed in China, um, but Airbnb is, by definition, a global network. In many ways, our core competency is countries living together. And so we thought, really specifically, how can we invest and be really much more aggressive about taking advantage of the opportunity we have to grow in China? And those are just some of the examples he's helping us think through. So last time I checked, and it's probably changed yesterday, but you have like you know, 160, 170 job openings. So if there's people out there that are thinking about you know, applying to Airbnb, how should they think about it? How should they approach Airbnb? And how do you fill that? You are in a very competitive environment for, for talent. So how do you think about that? Yeah, it is quite competitive. Um, here in the Bay Area because there's like so many great companies to work for. Um, I guess the way I think about Airbnb, there's this old kind of parable, I'm sure many people have heard it. Two men are like laying bricks and a man walks up to the two men and he asks the first man, what are you building? And the first man says, I'm building a wall. And he asks the second man, what are you building? He said, I'm building a cathedral. They're building the same thing, but one has a job and the other has a calling. And so I guess what I would say is, in many ways, not to get used semantics, but like these aren't jobs. Their careers are hopefully callings. And so I think the number one thing to say is if Airbnb is the place, you know, I, when, I, when, when, when people, like sometimes like recruiters try to get me to help close a candidate, and the irony is I usually try to talk them out of it because I'm sure we can hire a lot of people. I just want people that are deeply passionate. And the way I'd say is if this is the company you would like to work for, more than any other company because you feel like this purpose and what we're doing maps to what you believe in and you want to be a part of, then this is the company for you. And that's the most important thing. And if that's the case and you're deeply passionate and you're really good at what you do, then yes, I mean, we do have more jobs and uh, more openings that I can keep track of. But I think that's the number one thing. And I think there are so many great companies here with so many great purposes and we're really finding people that are the intersection of what we do and what they love. So what's been your aha moment? Just generally, um, um, I would say, you know, the aha moment for me probably is fairly personal. Um, I assume you just mean that generally, so I'll use a personal example. Um, you know, going back, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in, as I said, Albany, New York, and 
my parents, you know, like I was obviously a very maybe disruptive child and hyperactive and all those kinds of things. <laughs> what a surprise. Yeah, yeah. And my, uh, and my, my parents used to like, I remember I, I would watch TV and then as a child, I remember seeing Walt Disney come on the, the TV. It was like the wonderful world of Disney on mm -hmm. Sunday nights. And my parents said, if you're good, one day, because they knew I liked art, you can one day be an animator uh, and you can paint. They, they actually made the example. I saw people painting cells. I said, you can paint cells for Disney and be a painter. Of course, that job doesn't even exist today. It's all um, kind of digital. But the point is, when I was growing up, I never knew, I never thought I could be an entrepreneur and grow and build a global company. In fact, I never even heard the word entrepreneur right. growing up. The only entrepreneur I knew was Bob from Bob's Pizza. And that wasn't like something I was interested in. I didn't want to have a pizza shop. So I didn't think this was available to me. And my parents believed in me, but their believing me was, I believe you can get a job and that job can have health insurance. And that was them having a lot of faith in me. Sure. I guess the aha moment for me is that in my story, in many ways, I'm extremely lucky. You know, a lot of, like, I, I happen to have great co-founders, and we had this really interesting idea at the right time in the beginning of a recession, and it was kind of the right conditions for a new model around housing and travel. But the more important lesson isn't that I was lucky, and I'm not extraordinary or uniquely gifted, I wouldn't say. Um, I think that my story is not different than the possibilities of anyone's story. I think that we go through life um, underestimating our own potential. And nobody growing up would have said I was, oh, I would have done what I'm doing today. I, no one would have said that, or not many people I don't think would have said that. And they were wrong. I was wrong. I didn't think this was possible as well. And so the aha moment for me is that we all have this potential in us that is so unrecognized. And the only way you really can ever know your potential is to get outside your comfort zone, to put yourself in an extraordinary environment that is deeply uncomfortable and see if you can survive in it. I think the thing that we'll all find that so many of us can't actually survive and even thrive in those extraordinary environments. For me, I'm 34 years old. To be kind of put in this position, it's a fairly extraordinary environment for me, but I'm, it's not unique. I think it's just that I was kind of thrust into something pretty amazing and I've just adapted. Well, on that note, I want to thank you very much for coming today. Would you guys join me? This was, this was terrific, thank Brian. You. Thank you. Thank you.